And so let's go back to Nate. Nate, you have been the hammer of the conference, if I can use that. And uh, here we have now a session in which you are going to share with us some more information about Eric slash Hammer, I hope. So Yes, uh, specifically uh, here talking, using it as a, a, a base for a, a case study in, in doing open source tech development. Right. So your so, public is already getting great. So yeah, you are gone and the people are super excited. All right, great. Well, uh, hopefully you'll remain excited when I tell you that I'm not going to be talking a lot about uh, Eric or Hammer uh, in terms of its capabilities but rather uh, just using that as a case study for uh, both how to uh, consume open source software for uh, TAC development and how to release open source software uh, for TAC development. Um, I wanna put a little asterisk here in that I am not a lawyer uh, or necessarily even a, any kind of authoritative source on uh, licensing and some of the other processes and policies that go into releasing something as open source. But what I'm hoping to do here is um, just give my experience as an example that hopefully will help uh, at least uh, inform others as to what the right questions to ask are. Uh, so with that, uh, I'll just show the agenda here. For anyone that might not have been here for the earlier session, I will do a very brief review of what Hammer is, and um, I'll probably use Hammer and Eric here uh, interchangeably, uh, as uh, Eric was a, a name that the community came up with before Hammer even existed, I think. Uh, so I'll, I'll give a brief overview of, of the capability, but I spend the most, uh, the majority of the time here talking about both uh, employing open source software in your tech plugins and things that you might want to consider there and releasing uh, tech plugins or other tech related source uh, as open source and some of the things that you might want to consider there. So again, I, I suspect at least a, a good portion of folks may have been here earlier, so I don't want to uh, belabor any of this, but just uh, for context for anyone that wasn't, Hammer or Eric is uh, Hammer here stands for handheld acoustic modem for mobile exchanges with radios, and this is really all about um, all about building a software acoustic modem that we can run as an ATAC plugin, so that you, without any additional hardware, uh, you can take the digital data sitting in your ATAC device and transmit it on uh, over voice comms uh, using any voice capable radio. And so uh, here we use Hammer or Eric as uh, the, the, the basis on which to talk about some open source concepts. Uh, just quickly again, one uh, a figure here for anyone that wasn't here earlier, here's Hammer in action. Uh, you can send markers on the uh, COP map. Uh, it'll translate this into uh, an audio signal that you can use via either uh, a cable or just the speakers on your Android device and uh, on the receiving side turn it back into caught markers with uh, with things like chat and image sharing and uh, other data type sharing with intact uh, hopefully coming very soon so uh, i mentioned these kind of two sides of the open source coin uh, both having things that you'll uh, want to consider uh, employing open source and uh, releasing as open source and we'll, we'll start with employing so I, th I suspect I'm, I'm preaching to the choir here and that uh, many folks here might be even more familiar with some of the, these concepts than I am. Uh, but you know, the question is, why, why open source? Well, uh, why use open source is oftentimes you're going to get a, a great product. There's, there's a spectrum, of course, from somebody who spent 20 minutes on something in their basement and released it as open source to large communities maintaining something like Linux, for example. Uh, and so there, there is certainly a spectrum of quality, but a lot of times you get people who are passionate working on, uh, on these open source projects. And uh, at the very least, you have the potential for lots of eyes to get on the source code and potentially uh, improve it, find vulnerabilities, uh, things of that nature. And then, of course, 
typically these are going to come at a, a, a great price when you're talking about free and open source software. Uh, free is a pretty decent price to pay. Uh, but it's not all rainbows and roses. Uh, there are things that need to be considered uh, so that they don't have negative impacts on the rest of the software you're you're developing. Um, you know, I, in here I'll, I'll reference DoD a, a number of times. Uh, in some cases, DoD really is more broad than that in terms of federal government. In other times, it's really any anyone doing software development. Uh, and this is true here. If you're using open source software and plan to release that soft uh, the software that you're building, you need to understand the impacts of any of that that OSS that you're using. Uh, so there are lots of questions to ask, but one of the primary ones is, is it okay to make your own software, what you're developing, uh, open source as a side effect of using uh, others' open source software? And so to, to kind of just give everybody, uh, again, this might be old news to, to everyone, but to just kind of set a foundation here that we can all talk from, uh, here's a the spectrum of licenses, uh, at least as I see it, uh, where on the, the very left here, we see strong copyleft licenses. So these are going to uh, say that the use or modification uh, of something under one of these licenses implies that the, the, the thing that is using it or modifying it is going to inherit that copyleft license. Uh, so the, the most well-known example here is GPL v3, but there are others. Uh, and I'll, I'll put another asterisk here in that um, there is uh, some hot debate uh, across the software open source communities as to uh, whether dynamically linking uh, with other software uh, include has uh, the the GPLv3 constraints trickle through to the thing that is dynamically linked with it. So if you go and use a library, uh, does that make your software GPLv3 as well? And uh, in some cases, they, they've tried to be very explicit in this. And so like in the Java world, for example, there is such a thing as the GPL class path exception that tries to really uh, get around this and allow people to uh, employ other people's libraries without uh, being contaminated by them. Um, but there's a lot of subtle questions there and I, I certainly won't go into uh, detail, uh, but if you're looking at GPL v3 or similar uh, copyleft licenses, make sure that you kind of understand what their impact is on your software. In the middle here, we've got uh, what's called weak copyleft. So these are things like the lesser GPL, LGPL, uh, the Mozilla license, and one of the key components of these is it's trying to get around uh, and make it explicit that it's okay to use libraries uh, without having uh, the other uh, constraints of that library as license trickle down to you. So really these make it more about modification uh, implying that you're going to inherit the copyleft license as opposed to use implying that you're going to inherit that license. And then on the far right hand side here, uh, we're looking at what they call permissive licenses. And these are uh, really the easiest use to use in a lot of cases in that there is no requirement uh, that someone using this or modifying it uh, needs to inherit that license. So you have the ability to take something from an MIT license or an Apache license and use or change that however you'd like uh, and still sell that as a proprietary product or release it, your new product under uh, a different type of license. So those are uh, tend to be the most permissive and less the name. So uh, with that, let's talk about, I guess for a moment here, the, the open source software that we used in Hammer. Uh, so I mentioned this earlier in the, in the previous session for anyone that was there, but a, a very large chunk of the Hammer or Eric code uh, is using, uh, it, it consists of this open source acoustic software modem that we started from. And so this, uh, this software modem was released on GitHub with an MIT license. And so we were able to consume that and, and not have it control how we then released the Eric uh, plugin from there. And so the, the numbers that you see here are, are rough, but uh, this was just a quick analysis of the lines of code from, uh, from the Hammer Eric plugin, where roughly 10% of the overall code came from uh, 
new new lines of code that we wrote and this was largely about consuming the audio modem turning its uh its outputs into markers that we can display on the atac map and feeding it inputs uh that we we take markers on the map and turn them into cot for example uh, and so that that's really just about 10 percent of the overall code in the project whereas the other 90 percent uh comes from uh, from these open source tools with the audio modem here being the biggest one and so you can see this is like a, a nice reuse uh, case here where we can see uh, that we were able to do a, a, a lot and, and arrive at a, a what's hopefully a helpful capability for folks uh, relatively cheaply and easily uh, and still have flexibility in what we do uh, from there with the licensing. So I, I will touch a little bit more later on, on on employing open source software, especially as it relates to uh, to some of your dependencies, but now we'll shift gears for a minute and talk about uh, what if, some of the things that you might want to consider when releasing as open source. So there's there's four or five things that I'll I'll mention here. The the first one is what license to use, and really uh, this is comes down to a question of uh, how much control you want to maintain over how other people use the software once you release it. Uh, and how you want to uh, allow them to use your software in the first place. So asking questions like, do you want to ensure that all derived works are open source themselves? Uh, or do you want to ensure that all, even all linked works are open source themselves? Uh, these are the, the, the kind of questions you want to start asking uh, in order to determine which, which licenses are appropriate. And I should have included some links here, but there are online tools and guides out there for making a license decision. Uh, you can think of this as a, you know, a, a flow chart where you ask certain questions and that leads you to one end or the other of that spectrum we were just looking at. And then from there within, uh, within each segment uh, to specific licenses that might be best for whatever your particular needs are. Uh, if you've got questions, uh, you can turn to folks like if you're doing this as part of uh, something that your company is doing and you've got a contracts representative, they can oftentimes be uh, helpful government program managers, fellow coworkers, uh, though they might often have uh, strong opinions in some cases here. Uh, all, all these folks can help it, along with the kind of tools that I, that I mentioned above. Uh, and and there, there really is a lot out there uh, just Googling around that you'll, you'll find. And uh, if I can, because uh, we have this conversation in a dedicated Discord channel. In a past life, I've been with IBM and I did a certification on open source licenses. And I learned there that it's another license that is really relevant. It's called EPL. That is a clips uh, uh, public license that we basically use every day because there are a lot of commercial tools and open source tools based on Eclipse. And this license has been written by lawyers to ensure that you can do exactly that to you know, create open source uh, style uh, development, but also to build commercial tools that you can uh, sell. Um, so that, that is also something to consider. And by the way, uh, FTS is released under the uh, EPL license. Excellent. Yeah, thank you for mentioning that one. I, I, I did not have that on the slide earlier. And uh, it's a good point for two things. One, that EPL is something that folks should definitely look at. And two, that the examples I had on the, the earlier slide should certainly not be considered um, comprehensive. Uh, there's lots and lots of licenses out there. Those were just some of the, the most well-known, but uh, clearly missing some like EPL. So thank you. So in the case of Hammer, uh, what we wanted was to be able to, to release it in a strong copyleft manner, but not have those same restrictions that, that such a license would impose be imposed on the sponsors of the work. And in this case, it was it was funded by the DOD. Uh, everywhere on this slide, I think that you see DOD, though you can really replace that with uh, federal government. So the, um, the license that we selected was GPL v3, uh, which means that uh, you can use this, you can modify it, but the resulting code uh, is gonna inherit that GPL v3 constraint. Uh, however, the, the contracts that we do some of this DOD funded work under also grants the government unlimited license uh, to, the, to the developed capabilities. And so this is a, a, a case where we can control kind of the, the broader uh, use of the tool 
but still allow those funding agencies uh, and, and the US government in general uh, that help create the work to be able to use it however they see fit without uh, worrying so much about the, the GPLv3 constraints. One thing I mentioned earlier, and I'll just mention again for anyone that wasn't here, we do also plan to expose the, the Hammer API uh, such that folks can use this without even needing to care about the source code. So what we built was a, a plugin that is going to provide the user facing capability for this tool and if it meets your needs terrific use it as is uh, but we suspect there may be others out there that want to kind of use this as a building block to to build other tools and so we, we do plan to release that api so whether it's open source or not you can uh, which that would be but you can uh, consume the functionality uh, from other plugins so if License selection is one of the first things you want to consider. There are still several other things that, that folks should think about, uh, especially if you're doing government-funded work. Uh, in the DOD realm, for example, there are going to be uh, typically contractual requirements that any software or documentation that you want to release to the public needs to first go through an approval process by a, a controlling office. So with Air Force, uh, there's a public affairs office at Wright-Patterson that will uh, undertake this for you. Uh, if you're dealing with DARPA, there's uh, the DISTAR process uh, and ONR, all these other agencies will, will have similar processes where you can submit uh, your source code or your documentation or both and have them review it. And this is just giving the government a mechanism to verify that what you built under their dollar uh, is not going to pose a risk to national security. Uh, and so oftentimes this is going to be a required step uh, for anyone who is doing DOD funded development and wants to release something as open source, uh, but hopefully it's not a, an, an onerous one. As long as you give it a, a little bit of lead time, it, it, hopefully it, it should not be too problematic. Uh, and so if, if you're in this situation, talk with your government PM uh, who will be able to at least point you in the right direction or get things submitted for you. So, we talked about licenses and we talked about getting distribution a kind of public release approval for government funded work uh, back to something that's now uh, more generally applicable regardless of who funds your work are u.s export constraints so and, there are uh, we have the last 10 minutes sorry to interrupt but uh the, the 10 minutes warning okay thank you i am uh i think i'm only a couple slides away from the end here so hopefully that'll still leave time for for slides thanks for the heads up so there are U.S. government bodies, uh, there are rules, there are processes that all exist to control export activities. Uh, and while it might not at first seem that way by open sourcing something and posting it on the big eye internet, uh, you're actually making an export uh, and, and as you're making it available to non-U.S. persons who also have access to the internet. And so there, there's two things that could potentially govern uh, what you can and can't do with something from an export control standpoint. One is the International Traffic and Arms Regulations, or ITAR, which is going to restrict the export of defense military technology. And the other is something called the EAR, which is the Export Administration Regulations. And this is a U.S. Commerce Department run set of uh, export controls. Uh, while there are lots of benefits to working for a small company, one of the benefits of working for a, a large one like Raytheon is that there is a whole export control organization within the company. And, uh, and in this case, in the case of Hammer or Eric, we were able to work with them to get an export determination where there's uh, certified engineers who look at the, the code and the, or look at the uh, description of what you're building at least and uh, look at the ITAR uh, list and look at ear controls and can determine uh, which of these may govern your releaseability. And uh, within ITAR and ear, there's dozens or maybe hundreds of subcategories that each with their specific uh, constraints as to who and how and when uh, you can release the software. And so uh, having somebody who knows what they're doing in that space is, is important. And I think maybe the last or second to last slide here is uh, just talking about dependencies uh, and use of those dependencies in internal libraries uh, in software that you plan to, 
to release or hand over to others. So as uh, as you're building any software system, uh, you know you're going to use external libraries, third-party libraries. The 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 days of writing an entire software suite from scratch are, are largely over here in pretty rare cases today. And there are tools out there like Gradle and Maven that make consuming third-party software very easy. Uh, you don't even necessarily need to go out to uh, somebody's website to figure out uh, how to download it. And you just enter a line in a Gradle file or a, a Maven file or an Ant file or whatever it might be. And in these cases, uh, it makes life easy for the developer, but it also makes it very easy to violate the licenses of the software that you're using because you're often not even going to see them. And so you might be using dozens and dozens of third-party libraries, in some cases without even realizing which ones they are, uh, and in often times doing so without realizing the licenses that they have and what that might uh, do to your to your software that you're building. So. The, the flip side of the coin that where Gradle and, and Maven make these kind of things very easy to violate, they also provide tools to ensure that you don't. So there are plugins, for, for example, for Gradle that will automatically scan the list of dependencies and your transitive dependencies that you might even, not even be explicitly uh, listing and uh, find out what licenses are for each of them and, and produce a report. And while this isn't uh, perfect, it can take care of kind of the the 80 percent of uh, your dependencies and leave just that last bit for manual inspection so in, in addition to third-party dependencies internal dependencies can sometimes prove problematic uh, the the example from hammer or eric here is that we used a set of atac utility code that bbn has built up over the past several years and across numerous projects and it, it's something uh, that makes us able to develop ATEC plugins faster and easier and spin people up uh, in, in a nicer way. And so it's something that the company considers as a competitive advantage and didn't necessarily want to release that for uh, general purpose use. So in cases like that, where, where you've got uh, a dependency that you don't, that you're using in your software, but don't necessarily want to uh, release as open source itself, that's another thing that, that you need to really look at. In, in our particular case, we had only used a handful of the methods from this library, and we were able to just extract that minimum set of code, include it directly within Hammer, and open source the whole thing. Uh, and so it, it, we had an easy solution there, but it may not always be quite so straightforward. And I think with that, that that's all I had. Um, hopefully that at least gives folks some things to think about. And uh, again, while not being a, a, a lawyer here or an authoritative source, I'm happy to take questions. The real question that everyone uh, is asking here is when are you going to release the full thing? That is what people are dying for. Can you give uh, us some, yes. some hopes? I, I'm, I'm hoping that it's next week sometime. We will have, um, we're working to get this uh, signed and released and in the Play Store for direct use. And in terms of the open source piece, uh, Raytheon has its own GitHub page that I just need to get permission to uh, post to before I can put the code up, but it's ready to go. We've got all our approvals, uh, all of the steps that I just talked through, we've, we've gone through. So I suspect uh, in the next handful of days, uh, this will be up and we'll make sure to drop some uh, hints as to where you can find it and when it's out there on uh, Discord or Reddit or, or some of the other common places here. That is what uh, the 133 people that are resistant until now wanted to know. So thank you so yeah. much uh, for providing us uh, this information at, and for sure doing open source is not as simple as it will appear. And here I have another question for you. Uh, any chance of a Zwok releasing through TACGOV or will it always be released on FRS? So I'm not sure what the question means, Jan, but I will ask it nevertheless. A Zwok release, you know what that is? That's I'm, I'm not sure if I heard it Yeah, Jan is a kind of military guy, he's using a lot of uh, three letters. Uh, I well, I'm not that, sure that I've heard it. 
Yeah, uh, pro probably it's, uh, the question is, uh, we are going to get it on GitHub, correct? And on the, the Play Store, is that correct? Correct, correct. correct. So, uh, 